can see the slides. Is everything fine? Perfect. Then 11.15, maybe we can start with the lecture. As usual, the first thing that I would like is just to make some questions or to give you some time so that you can make some, que some questions regarding the last lecture. Is everything fine in the last lecture? Do you have any question? Any question? So I think that everything seems to be fine. So maybe then let's try to make you one question. Imagine that you are working in a small company, yeah? And they need a very small processor just for controlling a couple of processes. Something very, very small, but you want something which is programmable so that you can change it slightly. From all the architectures that you know, which one will you choose for that project? And why? I'm not sure if everything is working. Did, did you get the question? So in our last slide, we discuss a couple of architectures, stack machine, accumulator machine, register machine, and inside register machine, CISC and RISC. Imagine that you need something small. What will you use? And why? So one option is uh, accumulator-based processor. Why that architecture? Why not a CISC? Actually, the answer is right. Why do you think the accumulator will be an option, a good one? In fact, the accumulation machine will be an option because this kind of processor is relatively small. Since you are reducing the accumulator, the amount of hardware that you need is small, but you pro provide a good uh, performance. Actually, if you want to be even more drastic, if, it, if you want to reduce even farther away, then you could use actually a stack machine. Yeah, probably this was this will be the smallest of the different options. Good. So a stack machine, maybe accumulator machine will be the typical options. If you want to increase performance, then accumulator machine, register machines. Okay. And if you want to go even further and to have a higher and higher and higher performance, then probably we are going to use a set of risk, a multi-core system. Maybe another question. In the lecture, we were discussing different, uh, let's say, ways of improving the performance. And in particular, we were discussing pipelining. So in your laptop, you have a processor, let's say an Intel processor, an AMD processor. How big do you think is the pipelining that you have there? In our lectures, we were describing the typical pipeline and we were saying these are the typical five stages. How many do you have in a high-end processor? Typically more than five, 10, maybe 20, yeah? Actually today in modern processors, you have more than 10. 
And then my question is, why do you have so many pipeline stages? So here we have fundamentally just five. One, two, three, four, and five. This is the most, let's say, typical approach. Why today we have 10, 20? Please tr try to grow to everyone. It's not to work in parallel. So if I increase the pipeline, the number of stages, what do I gain? Speed, this is the right answer, speed. So if you have more pipeline stages, then actually you can have a higher clock, yeah? In modern processors, for example, you have maybe just two pipeline stages just to move data from and to the cache, yeah? The, actually, the price that you have to pay is that then this forwarding and so on is getting more and more difficult, okay? So just to make sure, it's clear, remember, this is an important slide. It's clear the five typical stages that you have today in a risk. Good. I, I said, I would like to take maybe 10 minutes just making some questions to make sure that you understand perfectly last lecture. Next question related exactly to these instruction phases. Here we have five pipeline stages. There is one, this memory, which is not always used. So if you have one instruction like an add instruction, R1 equals R2 plus R3. In this kind of instruction, you are not using the memory. So why not to have instructions which have only four stages, IF, ID, X, and WB, and then to have other instructions which have five stages. I mean, you will have to have some additional logic, but why not to be more intelligent and to have some instructions with four, some instructions with five? What do you think? It's a good idea or a bad idea? There is one answer in the chat already. Mm, it's not so good. The one with four would need to wait for the ones of five. Actually, this is not precise. So my, the, the point, it is wrong, but actually the point will be the following. Let's try to make this screen black or white. And I try to, to tell you. So I have one instruction that takes one, three, and four. Maybe there is another one that takes five. Then maybe there is another one that takes five. Then there is another one that takes only four. Oh, sorry then it seems that if some of the if some of the clocks of the instructions require just four clock cycles maybe at some point you will be a little bit faster i try to repeat since that the voice is not okay so if you have a pipeline yeah here we have it where some instructions take four stages and other take five, then in principle, we can use the same idea of the pipeline, yeah? And then we reserve, we are executing more than one instruction in parallel and so on and so forth. 
why is this a bad idea? Why it is better to have all the instructions exactly with five stages? Why five always? Actually, the answer, it's more structure, is in the right direction. It's not only higher structure. The point is that if you have a mixture of four and five, you may have a problem. Imagine that here we have one with four. So this will be instruction fetch, instruction the code, then execution, and then here, right back. Then here we have one with five, instruction fridge, instruction the code, execution, memory, right back. And then here we have another one with four, instruction fetch, instruction D, execution, and then here, right back. If you have a mixture of four and five, then at some point in this clock cycle, you will see that both instructions need to do the write back. If we have a very clean architecture, if we always wait for, let's say, five clock cycles, like we have done in the previous slide, like we are here, then you never happen, it never happens, it never happens that in one clock cycle, two instructions need to do the same, okay? Because of that, we need this regularity. Good. And then maybe the final point that we have to review today to make sure that there is no question is just this one, the idea of forwarding. I want to make sure that you understand it from the logical point of view. So if it's an execution, we can take the value and so on and so forth, but also from the hardware point of view. If you think in terms of the hardware, you see that from time to time, the arithmetic logic unit is taking the values from here or from here. With the help of these multiplexers, we are taking those values, yeah? And thanks to that, we can have a pipeline, we can avoid some of these uh, hazards, okay? So no further questions. Good. So if everything is fine, maybe we can start today moving in terms of complexity. So last week, we reviewed the standard silver processor. In this kind of processor, yeah, we have five stages, everything is fixed, you do that, everything at compile time, everything is easy, yeah? What we would like to do today is to try to increase the complexity of our system. Let's go then to the next block. I see that there is some points regarding the, the, the voice. I'm not sure. I believe everyone now has mute the phone. The microphone, yeah. So I'm afraid that this is the best that we can do. If we continue with the problems, the only thing that I can try to do is to join with a telephone. I will try to, to talk a little bit uh, louder. Yeah, 
just let me know if at some point something is not clear and I have to repeat it, even if we go a little bit slower. I said it, yeah. So I hope after some editing, I can start to upload at least pieces of the lecture so that you can just yes, uh, keep it at home without any problem. Good. Okay, so let's move ahead to our new topic. The top, the name is dynamic scheduling. If you are interested, you can have a look to this in our book. Here you see the German version. You can also find the English version. It's online in our library. You can just connect to the library and yes, you can download the PDF of this book. Yeah, just check for the author, Patterson and Hensey. This book is really huge. Yeah, we are going to cover just some part of it. But if you are interested, this book, Computer Architect Organization and Design is really excellent. Okay. So what is our goal today? Actually, what we will try to solve is the following problem. How can we create an architecture where we can execute one instruction in every clock cycle? We can do things as fast as we can. Yeah. In principle, what we will try to do is to add some hardware, which is analyzing our instructions in such a way that he realized dynamically yeah, if he can reorder the instructions in such a way that our processor can work faster. So the point is to try to solve the dependencies, not at compile time, but dynamically. If we are able to do that, our compiler will be simple. Yeah. And then Whatever we have done, our program will run in all the processors. Good. Imagine that you have these instructions. I have one division. So basically, I want to do that F0 takes the value F2 divided by F4. Then in the next instruction, I am doing F10 takes the value F0 plus F8. And then I have the instruction F12 takes the value F8 minus F14. When you try to execute these instructions, you see here we have F0. You will go to update it. Here we need F0. And because of that, we have a dependency. If the division instruction is very slow, then you have to wait for a lot of clock cycles until the value of F0 is ready. And only then you can this addition. Okay. But if you think carefully, this instruction does not require F0. So in principle, we could execute first this instruction then this instruction and then that one. If we do this, everything will be fine. And then we will not have to waste so many clock cycles. So our point today is, can we enhance our processor in such a way that the processor itself is doing this reordering automatically? If our processor is so intelligent that he can do that, then of course, he will be much, much faster. Clear the idea? As someone points in the chat, 
we are breaking the fundamental idea of processors. Things are sequential and we are going to break this sequentiality. This is hard, this is dangerous, but we can gain a lot, okay? So if you want to summarize it, what we are going to do is out of order execution. The execution of the instructions is not going to have the same order that the sequential order that we have in instructions. We are going to read the instructions in the right order, but we are not going to execute the instructions in the same order. Good? If you do that, you will see that things can get really, really crazy. You will see that we can have a lot of different hazards, okay? There are some hazards, like for example, the structural hazards. We have one divider and we want to execute two division instructions, yeah? This is something that we can, uh, let's say, check in the IDE stage. But there are a lot of other problems that can appear because of the out of order execution, yeah? Let's see, for example, this code. Here, I want to update A0 with the division, the result of A2 divided by A4. But here, I need F0, so I have an hazard. So do you remember how this hazard is called? I repeat it, here we have an hazard. Do you know how this hazard is called? Yeah, this is the normal read after write, what we have been discussing. So everything here is clear. Now we have here one instruction that reads from F8. And here we have another instruction after that, that update F8. It is a problem. In principle, it should not be a problem. Yeah. But if we change, the order of the instructions, then we may have a problem. If we move this instruction up, then the value that we are going to read from F8 here is going to be wrong. This is a write after read hazard. And finally, there is another problem that it can appear, which is here. This instruction is updating F6. If we change the order, the final value of F6 will be wrong. This is a W, A, W, a third, right after right, yeah? If we want to do out of order execution, our hardware, our processor should be so intelligent that he will take into account also this stuff. Here we have one example in assembler for the MIPS processor. Yeah, if you want to have a look in the previous slide, you have a description of this assembler, or if you want in the book, you can read more with more details how this language look like. But basically we have just one instruction after the other, what we are doing. This is the destination and this is the source, okay? Clear then the problems? Yeah, so we want to take this into account. <coughs> so our hardware should be able to prevent write after read and write after write hazards, yeah? then we will have also to deal with the problem that maybe some instructions will have a variable latency. Yeah. And this makes forwarding much, much harder than it was in the past. Okay. Also another problem is what happens if we have interrupts, if we have exceptions. If we have exceptions, then all these hazards get even more and more complicated. 
this is one problem that we will just mention, but that we are not discussed with much detail. Okay. There is a lot of architectures that try to solve this problem, that try to do this out of order execution. We are going to discuss two of them, scoreboard and later on Tomasulo, which are the basic of all the modern processors that you have right now. We are going to start with the scoreboard, which is one of the simplest approaches, very, very simple, very, very simple to understand. Okay. The idea is the following. We are going to divide the instruction decode stage in two parts, issue and read for operands. In the issue, we just decode the instruction and check if we have a structural assert. So you are going to make sure that you are not going to do two divisions at the same time, let's say. Yeah. And in the second part, we read the operands. Yeah, but we'll wait for read the operands until we don't have any data asserts. Once we know that we can do a safe read, then we will read it. Okay, so remember that these two things before were only one stage. Now we have two stages for doing that. Why this is a good idea? Because we can separate between issue and then read operands. Okay, the fundamental architecture based on that idea is a scoreboard that was created for a very old processor in the 60s. The idea is that our execution will execute whenever there is no dependency with the previous instructions and no asserts. So we just wait until we can execute. Good. So we will have in order issue. This means we are going to read the instructions in the same order that they appear. But we are going to do the execution out of order. And also the write of the results is going to be, of course, out of order. Yeah. In order to do that, we are not going to do any forwarding. So if we have a problem, we just wait. Yeah. And we are going to have imprecise interrupts. For the moment, we are going to forget this part. Yeah. But how scoreboard is dealing with interrupts was not pretty clear. Okay. Here you see the architecture. You see, the idea is extremely simple. We have one bank of registers. Then here, we have our arithmetic logic units. Every unit, maybe we have more than one, is reading from the registers and then writing back the result. Whenever we have one instruction, we will not that we have to read the registers, the execution unit will start to do the operation, and then we will write the result back. Good. All this is controlled by this scoreboard. This scoreboard is something like one algorithm that remember which are the execution, the instructions which are currently executed, which are the registers that are currently read, which are the instructions that write to update some registers, and make sure that everything works fine from the logical point of view. So the key point is this guy where we have all the smartness to make sure that we don't have any problem, okay? From the point of view of the data path, you see every element just reads and then just write one result. Depending on the complexity of the instruction, maybe different instructions are going to have different execution times. Our scoreboard has to take that into account. Good. Clear the fundamental idea. Okay. 
Now, if I ask you, how would you implement a scoreboard? Hmm, you will have to think carefully. This guy has to be really very intelligent. Yeah, he has to know what are you doing, which are the instructions, what is spending, and so on and so forth. We hope that even we have to wait because we don't have uh, any feedback register, even if we don't have forwarding, we hope that by having a lot of different execution units in parallel, we are going to be much faster than previous architectures, okay? So we gain at some point, we lose at another one. Also note that this architecture is thought for floating point units. This kind of architecture was actually thought for one accelerator for floating point units. Okay? So which are the implications of a scoreboard? As we said, out of order complexion. Because of that, we, have, we can have write and read and write and write hazards. Yeah. How can we try to solve the write and read hazards? We will just stop, we will stall yeah, the write back until all the registers have been read. So if you have some instructions and these instructions need to read from the registers, we are not, we have, we are not going to update that register until that read has been done. Yeah. And also we are going to read the registers only during the read operation part. Good. You see, in the philosophy of, of scoreboard, if something gets complicated, just wait. Then how can we solve the problem of write after write? If we have two instructions, both of them are updating one register. Yeah. Well, the point is quite simple. We have some hardware that detects that this can happen. And then again, we are going to stall the issue of that instruction. So if we have two instructions that are updating one register, the second one will wait until the first one is completely done. Okay? And with that, we avoid any problem with write after write. You see that there is no additional registers. The registers are not renamed. We will see that later on, there are other approaches which are more intelligent. They use something like a renaming of registers. Yeah. You also see that we may have a lot of units which are executing instructions. And typically this is very efficient if we do pipelining in our instructions. So when we go here to our architecture, typically these instructions inside here, they have a pipeline. Okay. Now, in a scoreboard, we are going to have for issue the following points. During the issue of instruction, we just decode the instruction and we check for a structural assault. Just that. If there is an structural assault, then we stall. We wait. The instructions are issues yeah, in the program order. You say, I would like to execute this instruction in the same order. Yeah. But we don't do that. We await if we have a structural assault. Hmm? And also we wait if we have an output dependency, if we have a write after write assert. These are the rules to decide once we read one instruction, if we are going to tell to our machine, please execute it. Next step to read the operands. How can we read the operands? Again, we are going to wait until we have no data hazards. Once this is possible, then we will read it. 
Because of that, during this part of the operation, we are going to solve all the real read dependencies. Yeah? And you see that we don't have any forwarding or, of data. Once we know which is the instruction that we want to execute, once we have the operands, then we start with the execution. A functional unit, the divider, the multiplier, whatever, will start to do the execution. And at some point, after some clock cycles, he will signalize, now I am done, I have the result. As said, how long does it take? It depends on the actual instruction that you are executing. Okay, and once we have this, then we will write the result. But not always. We will check that we don't have any write after read hazard. If this is the case, then we wait. Okay, for example, here, this guy is reading F8. This guy wants to update F8, so when we are reading this, we are not going to write this result, yeah, until we are not sure that everything is fine. So, sorry here. We are not going to write this result until this read has been done. Good? Well, let me... Go, go back. Clear these, let's say, four phases. Clear? You see, we have issue of this Traction, read of the operands, two separate parts, and then execution, and then write back. Good. And these things basically just wait if you can have any problem. The issue, make sure that we don't have any structural assault and also write after write. The read operand will make sure that we don't have any read after write after start. The execution allows to have elements with different clock cycles, and the write result will make sure that we don't have any write after read hazard. Good. So somehow with this, I hope you get an idea about the algorithm. Now we start with somehow the hardest point. How can we implement that in hardware? We need some kind of finite state machine, some kind of controller that keeps some information. And out of that information, he decides what do we want to do. Okay. Here you see the fundamental part, the three fundamental parts that we have in a scoreboard. These are the hardware elements that we need. So first, we need something like an instruction status. It tells us in which state our instructions are. Then for every unit, we will have a unit status. This is the most important part, yeah? For every unit that we have, the divider, the multiplier, and so on and so forth, we will record if this instruction is busy or not. Yeah, Which is the operand that we are doing? We may have one unit that can do additions and subtractions. So we have to remember what are we doing right now, addition or subtraction. Yeah, Then in this uh, status unit, we are also going to remember the destination register. So I am the divider, and once I do my division, I know that I want to write the result in the register three. 
I will remember that. And I will also remember my source registers. I am the divider. I know that I have to do an addition. And I know that I have to divide R3 and R4. OK? You are going to remember the IDs of the registers that you want to write and read. Good. Also, we are going to keep information about which are the functional units which are producing those results in Q. It can happen that I'm the divider. I know that one of my source is R3, but I have to remember that R3 is not valid yet. It's coming from another functional unit. And this can happen for register one or for register two. Okay. And then in addition to that, we are going to keep two flags that tell us if the results of the previous functional unit are already ready or not. Okay. You see, there is a lot of information that we are saving for every functional unit so that we are sure that we can take always the right decision. Yeah. Finally, there is a third part. We are going to keep some register result status. This is something like a table where we are going to remember if there are some registers that right now they are not clean because the result is coming from another functional unit. Okay. Now that we have a better view, let's try to go back. So in architecture, we have a lot of registers. Then we have functional units. Typically, these functional units internally, they have a pipeline. We may have more than one unit. We can have some units that knows how to do different operations, for example, addition and subtraction. Yeah? All the units are reading registers, values from the register, and writing the results back. To make sure that everything works fine, we have one unit that keep tracks in some tables about what every functional unit is doing. The other is updating R3 with the result of R2 and R4. Now I have one instruction, which is this. This instruction is ready. All this information, which is kept for every functional unit, is what we have described here. All this information for every functional unit is saved inside our scoreboard. OK? And then using this algorithm, issue, read operands, execution, and write back, a scoreboard will decide what to do. OK? You see, things are getting a bit more complicated right now. It's clear the idea. Do you have some doubts before we continue? There is only one minor detail. Yeah. Um, when you have this architecture, there are some instructions which are an addition, a division, and so on. Everything clear. But there are all the instructions which are reading from memory. 
for reading from memory, you have to calculate the position of memory where you want to read. And typically, this calculation of the position to read is done with the integer unit. So this guy is calculating the address to read from the memory. Even if it appears that when you read from the memory, you don't have to do anything. In fact, you are going to use this unit to calculate the position where you want to read or write to. So if we want to do one division, this guy is busy. If we want to do an addition, this guy is busy. If we want to read or write into the memory, this guy is busy. OK? Good. Now, to make things a bit clearer, what I would try to do is just to take one example and try to execute. So in the next slide, we are going to be a scoreboard. We are going to be executing some code. Yeah. First, we are going to try how we take the right decisions as a scoreboard. And later on, we are going to see how can we implement that in hardware. Okay. As I said, imagine that you are a scoreboard. You are the responsible of controlling these registers and the functional units. And we want to execute this code. So first, we are going to update the register F6 with the position of memory coming from R2 plus 34. So we take R2, we have 34. With this, we get one number. And this is the position of the memory where we want to read. And once we read the result, we will save it in F6. In the next instruction, we take the register R3. We increment it with 45. With that, we get one position of memory. We go to that position of memory. We read. And we are going to save the results in F2. So we have to load instructions. Then we have a multiplication. We want to say F2 takes the value F2 multiplied by F4. Sorry, F0 takes the value F2 plus F4. Then F8 takes the value F6 minus F2. Then F10 takes the value F2 divided by F6. And finally, F6 takes the value F8, F2. Yeah. You see that, for example, here, let me clear. For example, here we are updating F2, but F2 is here required. And also you see that it is here required. You see, for example, here we are updating F0. F0 is required here. You see, here we are updating F6, but F6 was required there. So in this piece of code, we may have some hazard. We are going to see how a scoreboard is able to solve that. OK? For doing this, we are going to use first this table, where we record at which point of time we are issuing the operation, reading the operands, executing the operands, or writing the result. Remember, these are the four steps, the four steps in our algorithm. Yeah. We will have another table where we are going to record the status of all the units that we have. We have one integer unit, two multipliers, one other, and one divider. And for every unit, we have to remember if it is busy, which is the operation that you are doing, the destination and the source registers, then if the data is coming from one unit, and so on and so forth. This is exactly what we have described here. And in addition to that, we have another table where we say if there is one register whose information is coming from one unit.
Now let's start. First point on time, we read this instruction. We realize that this instruction is a load instruction. Yeah. This instruction is going to use the integer unit. So now the integer unit is busy. What are we going to do here? We are doing one load operation, which is the destination register F6, which is the source register. We only need R2. This, we don't need it. And now we know that R2 can be taken directly, okay? In the second table, we remember F6. Be careful, F6 is going to be updated with the result with the integer unit. When the load operation finish, then we are going to get one value. This is what we want to put in F6. Clear? We have just read the first instruction and we have update our tables with this information. In the next clock cycle, this is the second instruction. Can we start to issue this instruction? So we have read this load instruction. After realizing that we have a load, we have update our table, the two parts of the table, yeah? Now a scoreboard knows what this instruction is doing. At some point, he will give the values to the, to the unit to do the operations and so on. Everything needs to be clear. So I repeat, what do we do here? Let me first delete everything. So what do we do here? We are going to do a load instruction. We know that a load instruction is using the integer unit. Now the integer unit is busy doing a load. In terms of the registers, this instruction is updating F6. And for that, it reads R2. Yeah, and actually these registers are already available. So do we, we don't have to wait for, on, for any unit to finish. So we know that we can just take the value. Yeah. This 34 it has a constant value that has to be added to R2. And this is actually what the integer unit is doing. You already have the 34. You can take R2, you can do the addition. With that, you get a position of memory. You go to the memory, you read that position, and then you will load the result in F6. Okay, first clock cycle, fine. Now the second clock cycle. We would like to tell our machine, please execute also this load. Can we do it? So this instruction is not yet done. Can we start to execute the second instruction? No. Remember, if we were in a normal risk processor, then you could, but uh, scoreboard is very careful. No way, he waits. So in the next clock cycle, he waits. He can just read the operation for the L2 instruction. Now you have the number in R2, then he goes to the memory, you cannot do anything, he executes it, he writes the result back. You cannot go to this instruction because you have not done this one. Only after you write back the result and your integer unit is not busy anymore, only then yeah, you can go for the next instruction. So in the clock number five, you can now issue this instruction. This time we are going to do a load. This load is updating F2. 
For doing that, he needs the register R3, and R3 is one register that you can take immediately. Update. And for the second part, now we have to remember that the register F2, if someone needs it, is going to be updated with something coming from the integer unit. Next clock cycle, clock cycle number six. Can we issue a multiplication? Is there any problem with the multiplication? So be careful. In the issue phase, we only care about a structural assert. The read assert will be taken care later on. From the structural point of view, the multiplier is fine. So we can actually issue the multiplication. Since the multiplier is not busy, we can say, I would like to do a multiplication. This multiplication will update F2. And for that, I need, so we'll update F0. And for that, it will need F2 and F4. Yeah. Now be, be careful. If you need one of these guys, F2, this guy is coming from the integer unit. Yeah. It's not ready. You have to wait. The other one, F4, you can take it, no problem. But these cannot be taken. Okay. We can already read the instruction. We can already issue the instruction because we don't have this structural assert. Okay. In the same clock cycle, the clock, clock cycle number six, we can read the operands that we need for this instruction. So now we have R3. Now, what will happen in the clock number seven? Can we read this instruction? It's a soup instruction and he wants to update as F. Is that possible? Yes. So let's go with that instruction. For this, we say it's a subtraction. We are going to use the unit that knows how to add and how to subtract. The destination is F8. The source is F6 and F2. Yeah. Remember that F2 is not ready. It's coming from the integer unit. It's not ready. And the other register, F6, yes, with this, there is no problem. You can take it directly. Now, for this instruction, we would like to do the read operands. Can we read the operands coming from the multiplier? Or do we have to wait? We have to wait. Yeah. We see in the table of the, multipl of the multiplier that one of the registers is coming from the integer unit and this integer unit is still busy. So we have to wait. We cannot do anything here. And for this instruction, it is in the execution. Can we start to execute it? Yes, you are going to execute that. Okay, and at some point, hopefully, you will get the result from the memory. With this result, you will update F2. And once I have F2, then I can start to read the operands for the multiplier operation. Okay. So can I read the multiple operations? Mm, bad luck, not yet. Good. Then clock number eight. In the clock number eight, we can read this instruction. I realize that this instruction is a divide. The divider is not busy. So now I can issue. It is a division. This division is willing to update F10. It requires F0 and F6. The value of F0 is not prepared. This value 
is coming from the multiplier. So I have to remember the value of F0 is coming from the multiplier. And the other value is F6. F6 is something that has been already been updated. So I can use it, no problem. Yes, you could. Yeah, there is only a problem here. And then I remember F10 is someone needed, the result will come from the device unit. Okay. In the same clock number eight, I can also finish this load operation. And because of that, I would say that now my integral unit is done, finally. And finally, I have the result of F2. And once you have F2, there will be a couple of guys that were waiting that now can read this element. Okay? So this is what we can do in F8. Just as an example, we are assuming that the multiplier is taking the clock cycle, the other is taking two clock cycles. Now, can we go for the next instruction So what, what do you think that there is a, a structural hazard? I think here we have one, but besides that, we have not had any other structural hazard. Good. Also, there is a small detail to, to remember. You see, when you want to do for when you are doing, for example, the division, the instruction is write in F10, F2 divided by F6. Yeah. But actually, you are somehow in the table renaming that register and saying, no, what you need at some point is the result of the multiplier. In this table, things are called the output coming from the register, blah, blah. And this small information from where it is coming is something like the forwarding or the logic of the forwarding that you need. Implicitly, we are something like doing a renaming of the registers, okay? Now, can we read the operand for the multiplier? Hmm, no. Now we are here. I know it's a little bit boring. We are going to come to a very interesting point. This is our current status. Clock number 10, sorry. I've seen that I have done just a small mistake. You are right. So we are here in clock number eight, and now in clock number nine. Can we read this instruction? So, Farad Khan says no. Could you explain why? Why it is not possible in cycle number nine to read this instruction? That's the good answer. Our other is ready. We, we don't care if the registers are not ready. This is something that happens here. In this phase, we only care about a structural hazard and right and right hazard. So here we cannot read the address, the other, because for here we need another. But our other is already busy doing this instruction. Remember. Yeah. If we have two units, then it will be fine. But since we have only one, this cannot happen. So in clock number nine, you can read the operands and things like that, but you cannot go here. 
Then in clock number 10, you cannot do anything. In clock number 11, we have the result of the subtraction because of that. But finally, in clock number 12, we get the result of F8. Then we update our things. Yeah. Now we start with the interesting thing. We are currently right now. It's the clock number 12. Maybe we can issue this instruction. Maybe we can do the read here. Maybe we can do the execution here. Now my question, can we read the operands for the deep? Can we read these operands? Remember, these operands are the register F0 and F6. F0 is coming from here, and F6 is coming from here, it's already done. Would it be possible? Neither. We cannot yet, so we have to wait. Finally, in clock number 13, we read, we issue, sorry, this element. Then in the 14, we try to read the operands F8 and F2. We just mark them here. And actually both of them are available. Then clock number 15, you cannot do anything. Clock number 16, finally the addition is done. Then you can update the registers and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, if you try to follow exactly what's going on, so we have done in clock 16, just this part. This still cannot be done, this cannot be done. Here, we are done with the execution. Okay, now in the clock number 16, here, could we write the result? What do you think? Why not? So, since you know that F6 is still required by another instruction, you know that you cannot update it until this guy reads F6, you cannot update it here. So in this part of the algorithm, we are waiting we update only the registers if we know that we are allowed to do that. We install it. Yeah. This is the problem. F6 is the destination of that guy, and here requires a source register. Okay. Then you can continue and blah blah blah. Then you don't have any problems anymore. We skip some cycles, and then finally. This will be the result. Okay. Um, I have gone relatively fast. I think it's a good idea if you try to fill this table and this table by your own. Yeah. You see that fundamentally what you have to do is just to follow. this algorithm issue read execution and write result you see now that during the issue you were checking the structural asserts not to use to load at the same time not to use to others at the same time during the read operation you care about the written write asserts you are not doing forwarding but you check thanks to this table that you are only reading the value when they are available. In the execution, you just start the execution and after some clock cycles, you know that you are done. And in the writer result, you have seen, we are taking care of that. 
we are not going to update one register if we know that there is another instruction that wants to read this register and it has not done this yet. Yeah. Just by following this algorithm, you can fundamentally update the table. And then this will be our final result. Let's go later to, to that point. Now, if we have this information, what can we observe? You see here, we have been issuing, the issue of the instructions is in order. One, five, six, seven, eight, 13. This order is the right one. But the execution is not in the same order. And the write back is not the same order. We have in order issue, but out of order execution and commit. Okay. And this is done in a way that from the logical point of view, we get the right result. Thanks to our tables, we know that the execution that we are doing is from the logical point of view, the same execution that this one. Even if the read of operations, the execution and the write of the result is happening out of order. So we have in order issue, out of order execution and commit. Okay. So if we try to summarize what we have seen with the scoreboard, we have seen that the scoreboard is actually very simple. It was one of the first ideas to, to do out of order execution. Yeah. But we see that we don't have any forwarding. Yeah. Actually, we cannot reorder too many instructions. If we have two doing an addition, then we have to stall. Then we have a small number of functional units. We see that every time when we have a kind of hazard, we solve them by waiting. And because of that, our architecture is relatively small, is relatively slow. Okay. You will see that we can try to solve that with Tomasulo. Now, I think there is one question. Can we try? Can, can you reformulate it again? So, in the clock number 10, let's go to clock number 10. So this multiplication is waiting for an F2 and F4. F2 is coming from the load. Only after the load is done, only then we can continue with the multiplication. So the read of the operands happens in the clock number nine. So this guy is actually has done the read in the clock number nine, then it's waiting. And at some point, the execution is done. So also there is one question, how can it happen that two, is, two units are accessing F2 at the same time? Let's see if this is possible. Let's go to a hardware architecture.
it is possible that two guys read F2 at the same time, no problem. As soon as one unit update one register, then this information can go to all the registers. That's fine. This is hard to implement. Yeah. This is hard to implement in a normal risk processor. In this kind of architecture where we have a lot of units, we need such parallelism to be able to write and then to read from more than one. Good. Then the other question is how long does the execution of every instruction? Remember, when you are in a risk processor, the arithmetic logic unit take always one clock cycle. When we are in these architectures, every unit can have different number of clock cycles. It depends on the complexity of the block. It can happen that the multiplier requires five clock cycles, they divide their 10, they add one, and so on and so forth. I repeat it. So how many clock cycles do you need? Depends on your hardware. In a normal risk architecture, yeah? In a normal risk architecture, you have to create your hardware to take only one clock cycle. In an out of order architecture, you can define the optimal pipeline for every unit and everyone can take a different number of clocks. Typically, if you want to do one problem with a scoreboard, they have to give you how many clock cycles do you need for every instruction. Yeah. So when you are here, you have to know in advance how many instructions do you need. Okay. In our particular example, we have said, okay, we need this guy 10 clock cycles and the other two as an example. Yeah. These 10 and these two are just uh, examples of execution. Actually, these are the ones that we're having in the original scoreboard. Let me go. So how many do you need here? It's just a constant that you have to make in advance. Before we move to the next topic, first maybe we can try to answer one question in the chat related with the assembler. Yeah, and then we can make a small break. So the assembler code that you have in MIPS, ARM, and x68, they, this is different because the instructions that you have are also different. I mean, the idea of assembler is just the same. One line is one instruction, but which are the instructions to execute is different. ARM and MIPS, they are pretty much pretty, pretty similar. Yeah, but x86 is completely different because it's more a sys architecture and the others are a risk architecture. Okay. I think it will be probably much more helpful if you now, just with this background, if you just try to read carefully the slides again, maybe the book, we are going to do a couple of exercises about the scoreboard. And then if I, there is any remaining in question, then next week or exercise, we can discuss that, okay? Do you see, we are increasing the, the complexity. Somehow the normal risk was a review, a scoreboard is getting more and more interesting. 
okay? Shall we then make small break five minutes? Let's say three minutes. Good. Then, okay, five minutes. Then in a couple of minutes, we continue with uh, our architecture with Tomasulo. See you in five minutes.
So I know that today is a very hard day. You have a lecture, then the exercises after that in the middle of the lunch, then for some of you, VHDL, then exercise of VHDL. Um, nevertheless, since we are a little bit slower in terms of speed because of this online teaching, I would like just to try to discuss the fundamentals of Thomas Uloch, just one or two minutes. Next week, we will explain the details. You have seen that the idea of a scoreboard, it's okay. It, man it managed to do out of order execution, but it has some deficiencies, yeah? So a couple of years later, the people of IBM start to thought, how can we do this better? How can we move things faster, yeah? And actually the goals that they have were to try to provide one, let's say coprocessor for floating point that could run faster than the previous one. In this particular architecture, you see that the, there was only two registers there. You were having four floating point registers and there were some differences in, in the architecture that actually were leading to a new, completely new, new concept. This idea of Tomasulo, actually it's the core idea which is used in almost all the new processors. Yeah? So historically it has some importance, but also the, the fundamental idea is very nice. Yeah? Let me just try to explain from the hardware point of view, how does it work? Here you have the hardware architecture of Tomasulo. Let's see what do we have here. So first we have one queue where we put the instructions. So you are getting instructions for your coprocessor. Then this coprocessor put the instructions there and then we are going to issue it, okay? This complete idea, this Tomasulo organization was created by one Italian guy called Tomasulo. Yeah, it's just the name of the guy in IBM that created that. Good. So what he did was, okay, we have here one queue for the instructions. Yeah. Then we have one place where we keep the registers. All the integral registers that you need. Yes, almost in the same way. Yeah. Then we have our floating point units, the other, the multiplier, whatever you need. But now, instead of connecting directly the unit to the registers, in between, we put something called reservation station. In this reservation station, we are going to save the registers that we need so that we can take them for doing the operation. Then once we have the operation, the result, then you can write the operation back. Yeah, you, you see this guy is the fundamental difference, preservation operation. Sorry, preservation station. Okay. Actually, this reservation station, yeah, can have a different size. For example, here we have two positions where we can save results in such a way that even if we have only one unit, here inside, you can keep the information for two instructions. Here we have another unit, the other. This other has another reservation station. And in this reservation station, we can save information for three instructions, yeah? So the fundamental idea then in this architecture, let me remember this. The fundamental idea in this architecture is that the units are taking the values from the reservation stations. 
once they have the results, the results can be written into the register file. But at the same time, the value that are written here can be taken by other reservation stations. In this way, the reservation stations are providing the results to the floating point units, but they are taking the source file, the source registers, either from the register file or from the other reservation station. By doing that, we will see that we can run much faster. We are going to have or to emulate that we have a higher parallelism in terms of instructions. We are going to save the results of the registers, not only in the register file, but also in these reservation stations. And thanks to this freedom, we are going to see that we can run much, much faster. Also fundamentally, observe that here we have something, this common data bus that allow us to put results and to directly to send them to the reservation station. If you remember, in the scoreboard, we had to write the results in the register file and only then we can take them. Here, as soon as one unit is producing one result, he will put that value in the common data bus and then automatically this value can be taken by the register, by the reservation stations, even if we have not updated the register file, okay? Clear just this key difference with a scoreboard, okay? So I said, next week, we are going to explain again from the hardware point of view, from the logical point of view, how this Tomasul organization works and why with this, we can get a much faster execution, out of order execution, okay? So I repeat it again, the key points. So the key points are the presence of a reservation station for every unit where we can save some source registers. So we don't have just to read from the register file. In this reservation station, we can save the value of some registers. Then we have a bit more freedom. Second fundamental idea, when one unit has some value, of course, this value will be sent yeah, to the register file. But at the same time, this value can be read directly into the reservation station. So we have something, the so-called common data bus, which is working as a forwarding unit, okay? These two keywords, reservation station and common data bus, these are the two fundamental innovations that we have in this Tomasul organization, okay? In this reservation station, we are saving the value of the registers. You, you, for the moment, you can think of these reservation stations like a small register file, but only for your unit, okay? Clear? So then I think maybe with that, we can finish for today. Thank you very much for your attention. And then, yeah, if there is no questions, then see you next week. Enjoy, see you.